crawl out of this fantasy I feel so bound to but I know I know that I need a deeper love one that I can't make thank you thank you thank you I'm so grateful to be here this morning, and I'm just so grateful to serve this church. You guys have a great church. Come on, do you agree with that? You guys have a great church. I want to I wanna take the time to welcome everybody that is watching online, too. How many of you know that they're just as much part of church family as anybody else and there are times, there are times where things come up and, and I might have to watch from home, but that doesn't not make me a part of the body. And so if you are watching today, we just want to encourage you, engage, engage with us, write some comments, uh, send us some direct messages, let us know that you're engaging in the service and how it's touching your life and what we can do to pray for you. I want to also take a little bit of time in case any of my kids are watching to just tell my son Chase and my daughter-in-law Bree and their two sons, Jordy and Bricks, that I love you guys. Bree, happy birthday coming up. Happy birthday. I want to say that I send my love to my son Christian and my daughter Claudia. Amen. So, I, I have the honor and the privilege, I've, I've had the joy of, of being able to speak here a couple of times. How many of you here the last time when I talked about how God wants to walk with us in the garden, but Satan wants to turn our garden into a bunch of graves and tombstones? You remember that? It was a minute, it was a little bit ago, it's all right. But I get the joy and privilege of serving churches all across America. Uh, literally from coast to coast, top to bottom. And it's so interesting because you get to see what God is saying and doing in the church. But here's what else you get to see. You get to see what the enemy is trying to do in the church. It's a very interesting perspective because it's not just localized, it's not just hot springs, it's America. And it's such an interesting perspective um, that, that really helps me to, to really speak into and lean into pastors and their staffs and helps us to be more effective where God's planted us. How many of you believe that God has planted you right here? Amen? So, um, you guys have been in a series called Growing Up, yes? Have, have you felt like the Holy Spirit has challenged you during that series in some way, shape, or form? Can, will you just put your hand up real quick? Hold it up, re, like really proud, like you're holding it up. Now look around the room. That's like the majority of us, right? Amen? Well, I get the honor of bringing you the last message about growing up. Aren't I blessed? So uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to pray. And I would just, I would ask you very sincerely, will you join with me in this prayer? Because I don't want it just to be me praying. See, part of growing up is I pray for myself, not just let somebody pray over me and just throw up a, yeah, 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 good job. Amen? So I need you to not just agree with this prayer. I need you to pray this prayer as well. So Father, in Jesus' name, we humbly come before you. And we're asking very specifically, Father, would you open up the eyes of our understanding? Would you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are. 
I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that, that you will help us all, every one of us under the sound of my voice, to see what you're saying so that we're not looking at something and totally missing it. Father, give us ears to hear your voice, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit so we're not listening and failing to hear what you're saying. And Father, we ask that you would give us a heart that is open and receptive to any conversation you want to have with us today. No matter what it is you want to talk about, we declare a heart posture that says, yes, Lord, we'll have that conversation. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, so 1 Thessalonians 23 and 24. I'm going to read this out of the NLT. It says this, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and make your whole spirit and soul and body to be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. Now just real quickly, just... It's so important that we understand the context that we're reading. Don't just pull one or two verses out and make your own judgment. Read in front of it, read behind it, read all around it, read a couple of different translations so that we make sure we really understand what we're talking about. So this letter here in Thessalonians, it was one of Paul's first published letters in its entirety that got spread across. It was actually even published before the Gospels were finally canonized. So this is Paul speaking into the church at Thessalonica. And they were like, this is really good stuff. Maybe we should copy this and send it to multiple churches. And isn't it interesting, we're still reading copies of it today. Because when God is speaking through an individual, it's actually God's words that are powerful and full of life. And so here's what I find interesting about verse 23. May the God of peace make you holy. um, and, And he says, make you holy in every way. May you be kept blameless, spirit, soul, and body. So Paul makes this distinction. And he he correlates and he connects your holiness and your ability to stand blameless with how your spirit, soul, and body is doing. So he's like, hey, hey, I want you to be holy and I want you to be blameless, but it's gonna depend on these three, three things over here, on how you're doing in your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, in case you're unaware, we are a spirit. We have a soul and we just live in a body. The body's not who we are, nor is the mind, will, and emotion who we are. It's our spirit man that will reside with our king forever. It's the very reason why if you've ever been to a funeral, the person that you're, you're visiting there doesn't even look like the person you knew because the real one's already left the suit. They go. We are a spirit. We have a soul, and our soul is our mind, will, and emotions, and we just live in a body. So Paul's saying, I want you to be holy and blameless, but it's going to depend on these three parts of who you are. Are you guys with me? So I want to read this again in context. So I want to give you just the snapshot real quick of all of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So verses 1 through 11, he's talking about us as children of light being ready for Christ's return. Okay, that's verses 1 through 11. And then in verses 12 and 13, he starts talking about honoring and, and submitting to those in authority. And then in verses 14, that goes all the way through 22, he, the, what I would call is just uh, Christian characteristics. He mentions his things like this. Hey, don't be lazy. Encourage the timid. Be patient with everyone. Do good to each other. Be thankful. Be joyful. Don't stop praying. Don't, um, don't stifle or, or uh, frustrate the Holy Spirit. It's almost like you could say Paul is encouraging the church in Thessalonica 
to grow up. To grow up. See, my two grandsons, it's so interesting watching them because they don't, they don't have to worry about necessarily growing up. They worry about, you know, eating waffles and, and watching SpongeBob and, you know, playing with their, with their stuff. But at some point, we all have to grow up. But isn't it so much easier when it's somebody else's job? Isn't that so much easier? Because I can just kind of defer to them or blame them. Can I tell you that happens all across the churches in America? We want to blame our pastor for us not growing up? We doing okay? We want to blame the church staff? They're, they're not doing a good enough job to help me grow up? And ultimately, we actually want to blame God. And we, we, we don't say this, but we kind of say this like, God, you're not Godding well enough. That, that's why I'm having such a struggle. You're not Godding very good. Pastor, you're not pastoring very good. Staff, you're not taking care of us very good. No, it's our job. And as a matter of fact, it's a biblical mandate. And the majority of the entire New Testament is Paul encouraging the church. Guys, we got to grow up. We got to grow in our faith. We got to grow in who we are. We got to grow into the image and likeness of Christ. Work out your salvation so that you can grow up. You guys with me? So here, here's what I, again, this is a really important part. I'm going to overemphasize this. You are a spirit. You have a soul, you live in a body. And it was always God's intention that your spirit would be the leader of the three. That was always God's intention. But can I tell you, that doesn't always happen. So there's always a battle between who's going to be in charge of the heart. Is it going to be the spirit that hopefully has been sanctified by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it going to be our soul, which is all about what I think, what I know, what I want, what I think should happen, my passions, my desires, my wants? There's always a battle. And is it safe to say like our body just goes along with whoever wins? Is that fair? Is that all right? So I, I, want us to, I want us to start, this is my first point, but it's a question that I need you to ponder. And be careful because I think we'll all know the answer, but I'm not interested in the right answer, I'm interested in your answer. So who, here's the, here's the question, who is the leader or the primary governor of your heart? Is it your spirit, sanctified by Jesus? Or is it your soul? That sometimes has to be renewed like every five minutes. Yes? At least let me put it this way, mine does. I'm assuming you're not too far away. So who's in charge of yours? And I really need you to think about it. And, and we're gonna kinda, we're kinda, go through this because if, if your spirit is in charge, the scripture tells us this, we were sanctified that fast, the moment our, that we said yes to Jesus, our spirit man was sanctified. And so if your spirit man is in charge of the heart, then you're going to, you're going to defer to what God says and what God wants and your understanding of the word. And, and even if it doesn't always make sense, my, if my spirit man's in the lead, he, he's going to push me to see things through God's eyes, not my own. But if my soul is in charge, then my soul wants to inform me based off of my past experiences. My soul wants to inform me based off of my own fleshly wants and desires. My soul wants to tell me what's best for me based off of my own desired outcomes, not necessarily God's. 
I want to show you a diagram of, of actually what this looks like. And forgive me, it's, it's a, you know, you'll, you'll understand it, but it's a diagram of the heart that will help you to kind of understand how this works. So here's, here's the thing. You, you'll notice there's a dividing line in the middle, but that dividing line doesn't go all the way to the top. And so here's the way this actually works according to scripture. Whichever side I feed the most overflows the other side and gains domination. So if, if I'm in the word and I'm constantly looking for God's point of view and God's perspective and, and I'm looking for him to redefine things in me, then the spirit side overflows and controls and holds dominance of the heart. But if my soul's in charge and all I can think about is what I think should happen or my own desired outcome or what's happened to me and the way people have treated me in the past or what I think is justice or what I think is best, then that side overflows and gains dominance of the heart and the body just follows along. We doing okay? Now listen, this principle, it's even talked about in, in Hebrews chapter four. And it says the word of God is strong, it's powerful, it divides soul and spirit. Can I give you like the Pastor Eddie version of that? It, it will tell you which side is right and which side is wrong, but it'll never force you to do it one way or the other, that's your choice. But it'll inform the decision, but the decision's still up to you. But the Word of God is strong, it's powerful, and it'll make a division because it'll show you specifically here's what God thinks and here's probably what you think. But now it's up to us to figure out who's really going to be in charge of the heart. You guys with me? Does this make sense? So again, that first question, who's in charge of yours? And, and all of us want to say, oh, Pastor Eddie, it's the spirit man for sure. It might have been like 10 minutes ago, but since then, the soul's taken over. That's why, that's why we kind of put the arrows going back and forth, because it's remarkable how much that changes. When somebody cuts me off out there on the street, you know how quick the soul can overflow. When somebody sends me a nasty grand message over Facebook or Instagram, you know how quickly that thing can overflow. Yep. But then when you're sitting like in worship this morning, isn't it amazing how that thing can overflow in our adoration to our King? But listen, it, it's almost like a, a dam inside of your heart and, and which side's gonna overflow which side to gain authority? So I, I want us to look at this real time and I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly. So again, what does it look like when my spirit's in charge or my soul's in charge? And let's just use 1 Thessalonians 5 as, as our kind of test subject. So again, verses one through 11, it's all about us being children of light and eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus, okay? So here's what it looks like when my spirit is in charge. When my spirit's in charge, I'm eagerly anticipating that today could be the day that my Savior returns in glory, and I'm, I'm, I'm constantly gauging, am I ready to meet my King face to face? I, I read the stories of like the 10 virgins, and you have the five that are vigilant, and they're prepared, and they're ready, and they're waiting. That's when my spirit's in charge. Here's what that same set of verses looks like when my soul is in charge. I got time. I've been hearing my entire life since I was a kid that Jesus is coming back. It's probably not happening in my lifetime. 
I'm good. I can kind of just roll how I want. I got time. Oh yeah, you remember like that book in the 80s? Like eight reasons Jesus is coming back in the 80s? Oh, and that didn't happen. And you remember like Y2K will be the day? Yeah, that didn't happen. And, and Brother Big's prophecy of when he's coming back and Sister Big's prophecy and not, none of that's happened. And so my mind tries to inform me, you ain't got to worry about that. And so how do you think that affects my behavior? I'm now the five lazy virgins. I ain't prepared. I ain't ready. I can just do what I want that feels good to me because that probably ain't gonna happen. You see the difference in the two. Just based off of who has authority of the heart. Okay, here's my second. Here's my second point. And, and we're gonna keep doing this. So I wanna look at the next two, verses 12 and 13. And that's all about honor and submission to authority. Now, here's, here's what I'm gonna tell you here. This, this is actually, this is actually what I wanna, want us to really focus on today as we wrap up growing up. And I'm gonna warn you, this, this has a chance to step on your toes a little bit. So tuck those dudes under your chair so I don't step on them, all right? But this, this is really what my message is gonna center around, is biblical honor and submission. And I, I wanna say a few things before we get started. For one, I know that this message has been used and abused to manipulate people. And I know this message has been weaponized, again, against people. And if, you, if that's you this morning, if you've ever been kind of used by the, the message of honoring and, and submitting, don't, please don't raise your hand, but if you're a wife in here and you've ever heard, you know, the classic Ephesians 5, like, you better submit to me, woman. Don't look at your spouse. You're only going to get in trouble. I'm just telling you, when it comes to, to true biblical honor and submission to authority, we've mishandled this. And here's what I want to say to you. If that's you this morning and you've ever been used or abused, I am so sorry. Whoever did that to you, I want to stand. Maybe it was your father. Maybe it was your mother. Maybe it was your spouse. Maybe it was a spiritual leader. Whoever it was, let me repent on their behalf. I'm sorry. If I've ever done that, for anybody watching online, if I've ever used honor or submission to authority, in an unhealthy, abusive way, I repent right now. I'm so sorry. But isn't it just like the enemy to make sure that it is twisted and perverted and used enough for me to push away from a good godly principle? You think that might be part of his strategy? Well, if I, if, if I can take it and kind of twist it, which is his specialty, then, then maybe they'll push away because, listen to me, honor and submission is more for your benefit than the one you give it to. It's more for yours. So I want to read verses 12 and 13 out of the Amplified real quick of 1 Thessalonians 5. So we ask you, brothers and sisters, to appreciate, to honor those who diligently work among you. Recognize, acknowledge, respect them as leaders who are in charge over you that, and, and in the Lord who give you instruction. And we ask that you appreciate them, hold them in the highest esteem and love because of their work on your behalf and live in peace with one another. That's verses 12 and 13. And he's saying this, He's saying, listen, these, these people are there to help you. 
not manipulate you. So what does this look like when my spirit's in charge? When my spirit's in charge, I understand where God says, listen, all authority, all power, all leadership, I've allowed it to be there. And when my spirit man's in charge, it's like, okay, listen, I think they're jerks. Can I say that in church? Is that all right? Come on. Can we just be real and transparent with no judgment? I don't think they behave like they should. I don't think they're even there because um, they should. Maybe they're there because of their last name or, or maybe it was by accident. But if my spirit's in charge, I'm like, you know what, God? If you'd allow, you've allowed it and you've allowed me to be under it. So just like King David, I'm going to respect my leader even when they're throwing spears. I'm going to honor them even when they're not very honorable. Can I give you one of my favorite quotes that, that I have? That you have never really honored someone until you adamantly disagree with them. You've just been in agreement with them. Because honor doesn't really show up until it's undeserved, it's unmerited, and I don't really feel like I should give it to you in the first place. That's when honor really shows up. It, it's how the entire kingdom of God works. Doesn't he say the same thing about love? Doesn't he say it's easy for you to love people that are pretty lovable and are loving you back? But I'm telling you, love your enemies that can't stand you. So I would say the same thing. You really haven't loved somebody until they are extremely unlovable and do not love you but you love them anyway. Isn't it the same thing about our, our giving of our tithes and offerings? I don't give to a pastor and I don't give to a church. I give to my father. So even if he were to mess it all up and spend it all wrong, I still get my blessing because I didn't give it to Pastor Matt. I gave it to my heavenly father and my reward is accordingly. And I'm not saying Pastor Matt's done anything appropriate. <laughs> See, it's just how the kingdom works. You haven't really done it until, man, the person you're giving it to, they don't deserve it. But that's why I'm saying it's not really for their benefit, it's for yours. And if my spirit is in charge, I, I can work through that to understand man, God, I love you and I know you love me and you're a good father and I'm going to honor in spite of whatever they're doing right now naturally. My, my natural father was a physically abusive man, a verbally abusive man. But I can stand here today and honor my natural father because God has set me free from that. God's healed my heart from that. I totally forgive my father. And I've told them that face to face. We're good. I'm good. And despite things that were done to me in my past, despite him reaching for whatever he could grab to hit me with it, man, I can honor my father. And guess what? Ephesians tells us that comes with a blessing of long life and prosperity. So did he deserve it? Probably not. I could probably say the same thing to my own kids, do I? Probably not. But my reality is this. I want the blessing more than I want my vengeance. You guys all right? So if my soul is in charge of my heart, you best believe I'm not, I'm not honoring you. You don't deserve that. I'm not giving you a stitch of my honor. I'm above that and you're below it. You think I'm going to submit to you? No chance. You're only there because your dad's name or you're only there because of this or you're only there. And my soul rationalizes every reason why I should not do it. 
And if my soul's in charge, guess what ultimately is going to happen? I ain't going to do it. And who suffers? Do they suffer because I didn't extend them honor? Who suffers? I do because I miss out on what God wants me to do because I was too emotionally immature. I didn't want to grow up. I wanted my way more than I wanted God's way. Amen? So here, here again, it's, it's point two. Do I sincerely honor those in authority? Do I sincerely submit to those in authority over me? Can I get in your kitchen a little bit? Can I do this? I'm probably going to whether you say yes or not. This is where you should probably tuck your toes in. So, so what does this look like right now? All right, what's that mean to me? Well, let, let's, let's, just, let's just get it out there and start with a bang. How about let's start right now with our heart towards our president? Because whether I like it or not, the current president we have has been allowed to be there by God because God places all people in authority. The just and the unjust. Do I, do I am I spirit led enough to pray for them, not to cuss at them? Am I spirit led enough to keep them lifted up before the Lord? Or do I look at some of the stuff and in my own flesh want to just send out a, a couple of tweets about that or a couple of Facebook posts or a couple of. How about this? How, how, about your, how about your boss at work? How about basically anybody in our life that has any sort of authority? Can I honor them in spite of them? Can I honor them? Can I honor them when they make decisions that I don't agree with? Can I honor them when I don't understand the logic? Can I still honor them? Can I honor them when, when I don't know and it doesn't seem right to me and it's not what I would do? Can I still honor and can I still submit? See, it depends on who's in charge of your soul. I, I'm sorry, of your heart. Is it your soul or is it your spirit? Who's in charge of your heart? Because that's going to determine if you can or cannot. Here's the last point I got for you. It's this, that, that that word submission is actually two words. Sub and mission. I need this to sink in. Here's what it means. Put, put whatever word you want. I'm going to give you a couple. How about subordinate? I am subordinate to the mission. That's what it means. The word submission is actually two words. I'm under a mission. I'm a subordinate to a higher mission than my own. That's what submission means. I'm, I'm subordinate. I'm underneath. So here's what it forces me to do. Am I a subordinate under a greater mission or do I hold my own mission as the top priority of which I'm not under? See, because our flesh doesn't want to be underneath anything. Our flesh doesn't want to be subordinate, especially when I think the ones above me a la King Saul, are throwing spears and consulting mediums and doing everything I would think is wrong. And yet, King David still honored him to the last breath of his day. I wonder why King David is so revered in the Scriptures, even to this day. Because one of his core values was honor. And even when the person he had to give it to certainly didn't deserve it, and there was all sorts of natural justifications for David to take his life and take the throne, 
David's heart was grieved when he just cut off a little piece of his coat. How could I do that to the Lord's anointed? Was he acting like the Lord's anointed? But see, here's the deal. David had a different mission than his own. He was subordinate to God's plan, not his plan. If you struggle with this, listen, this goes all the way back to the garden. If this, if this is like your heart's like a little torn about this and it's like, I don't understand how it works. Go all the way back to the garden. Do you want to eat from this tree of life, which is Jesus, or do you want to eat from a tree about your own knowledge, your own understanding? This happened in the garden. The battle of soul and spirit happened there. And we have been fighting who's going to be in charge of the heart ever since the garden. What tree are you going to eat from? You ain't from the soul. That's all about the tree of knowledge, your good and evil, and your ability to understand it. Are you going to eat from the spirit side, which is life? So my last point is, are you subordinate to his mission or your own? Here's what that looks like. Well, all right, all right, Pastor, tell me about that. What, what, what's, what's my mission then? You know, what's, what's God's mission? Well, first, if, if I do declare that I love Jesus, didn't Jesus himself said, hey, I'll give you a big time mission when he was asked, what's the greatest commandments? How about this? How about you just love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, your strength, everything, and love your neighbor next to you just as much? Listen, that is a mission that if I am a person of honor and, and I'm submitted, then I'm submitted to that mission. I'm subordinate to that mission. I'm going to love God and I'm going to love you even when you sure don't act very lovable. Will you do me a favor? Will you just look at your neighbor and will you just tell them, you don't act lovable all the time. You, you don't act lovable all the time. But hey, will you do, do, do this? Like, look at them one more time and say, look, look at your neighbor one more time and tell them this, I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to love you anyway. You don't act lovable all the time. You don't act worthy of honor all the time. But guess what? My ability to honor and submit is not really for your benefit, it's for mine. And I'm not going to miss out on the blessing of God because I'm so immature to let my spirit, I'm sorry, my soul control my heart. My soul craves vengeance. My soul craves justice. My soul craves equality. My soul craves all that. But if I'm spirit led and that side's overflowing, then I'm gonna be consciously aware that there's a battle going on nonstop. Every, sometimes by the minute. Some of you are battling right now because your soul is trying to get you to think more about where you're going to eat. I'm just saying. Doesn't make you a bad person, just makes you hungry. <laughs> Guys, this happens constantly. So I'm, I'm gonna bring myself into an awareness that this battle is, is happening by the minute at times. And I'm gonna hold myself accountable to which side is winning. And according to 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm, I'm gonna extend honor and submission. Whether I think you've earned it or deserve it or not, that's irrelevant. I'm gonna do it because I'm subordinate to a higher mission. I'm gonna do it because I wanna grow into a better version of a Christian than I was yesterday. 
I want to grow because I want God to trust me with more. Listen, whatever season you're in right now, it's just a test to get you to the next spot. That's all. And listen, your, your testing time is never wasted time. Wherever you are right now, you're just being tested. So you can get to the next spot that God has for you. See, it's why David went from uh, an Uber Eats driver. Oh, I kid you not. Oh, you can call him a pizza driver if you want, but he was an Uber Eats driver delivering bread and cheese to his brothers at the field while they were battling. He went from an Uber Eats driver to then he went to a praise and worship leader, starts playing the harp for the king. And then he went to battle and became a sergeant and rose the ranks, become a major and rose the ranks, become a general. All of this while he was anointed to sit on the throne. Why didn't he just go straight to the throne? Because your testing time is never wasted time. And God needs to put you... Th- through some things to get ready for the chair you're about to sit in. Now listen, Trinity Church, man, God's got some, God's got some amazing things. In sto- He's got some chairs planted and ready for some of you, but we got to go through some of the testing time to get to the chairs that God has for us. And I'm telling you, a primary way that God will test your heart is how well do you honor and how well do you submit to authority when they don't deserve it, when they haven't earned it. So do me this favor. Bow your head for a minute. See, Proverbs 3, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Proverbs 3 tells me this. To lean not on my own understanding. That's that's my soul, by the way. Lean not on my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge him, that's the spirit, by the way, and he will direct my path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. There's a nonstop battle for who's going to be in charge. So this morning, as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, and and I'm asking you, please do that. Do that to honor the person next to you. So don't look around. And, And the reason is because I want you to do work vertically with God right now. This is between you and him. But I want you to ask this question. Holy Spirit, What are you saying to my heart right now? What are you saying to me? And can I encourage you, whatever he says, please write it down. Honor the Holy Spirit's words and write them down. Whatever he says to you. What are you saying to me about this message? Here's what I want us to do. Father, if my soul has been the leader of my heart. Then I ask you right now, please forgive me. I know that's not your intention. Your intention is not for me to be led by my flesh and my soul. It's to be led by the Spirit, your Spirit, communing with mine. So I'm so sorry if I've allowed my soul to win. And I commit to you, Father. I'm going to start paying more attention. 
to who's in charge of my heart. But I ask you, Father, help me. Help me to see things through your eyes, to see people through your eyes. Father, help me to value people the way you do. You, you have a love that is so great that you, were, that you gave up your only son. Father, help me to grow up so I can truly honor and submit to authority that you have allowed to be there. You've allowed You've given it permission. Father, I want to grow. I want to grow up. I want to be emotionally more mature so I can be spiritually more mature. And I pray, Father, over everyone in this auditorium, everyone on the sound of my, under the sound of my voice, everyone watching online, I pray that you would give them an anointing. I pray that the anointing of honor would rest on this house. Father, that the culture of Trinity Church would be saturated with honor and submission, not the unhealthy kind, the God kind. Honor and reverence and respect and submission because we're honoring. I pray that that anointing would rest deep on this church and on its people. I pray it would rest so strong on this house that it would absolutely infiltrate the very culture of who we are. That people all around Hot Springs would know Oh, you're talking about Trinity? Yeah, they're they're some of the most honoring and respectful and submitted people I've ever seen in my life. That you would be known for your honor and your submission because the blessing is for you. Father, I pray these things In the gracious and precious and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you guys so very much for for letting me speak into your hearts and lives. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for the time that you spent with us this week. And uh, just want to, if you give me 30 seconds, I'm not going to re-preach anything that he had to say, but I want to put emphasis on what he had Y'all, I had a six-week series on growing up, and y'all might remember there was a, a, one sermon I did called uh, No Pain, No Gain, and that's, that sermon lasted for two weeks, and it was only supposed to be one week, so I had to cut out a sermon of that series, and that sermon was being spirit-led instead of soul-led. That's what I cut out. And then the Lord brings you in here to make sure that we heard it. And so put emphasis. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for that. He, wanted, he wants that for us, his people. Y'all, I bless you this week in the name of the Lord that where you walk will be blessed, that you will prosper in all things, that your leaf will not wither, and in every season you will produce fruit. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. found yet I'm still wondering if I can crawl out of this fantasy I feel so bound to but I know I know that I need a deeper love I can't make up I've heard
Deeper love. Yeah.